I mean, I didn't have some sexual desire for my mother, but when I would look at her, very beautiful blonde, you know, red lipstick, you know, very beautiful woman, I was like, mommy, yeah. As you, that looks really good. I like that. It goes without saying that my next guest has been wrong about a million topics and he's hurt a lot of people in the process. So a lot of scientists think anthrax might have come from Mars. What? Yeah. For over two decades, Alex Jones has run a platform called InfoWars, which still regularly reaches millions of Americans daily despite being unavailable on most platforms, including Roku. How the hell do you get banned from Roku? But I spent hours with the guy between my home in LA and the InfoWars headquarters in Austin and we really ended up hitting it off. He's like that kid you meet in elementary school. No filter, gets bullied for saying all the wrong things, he can accidentally hurt some people in the process, but he's actually more in touch with reality than the cool kids on certain topics because he's been so marginalized. I was first introduced to Alex Jones by one of my favorite movies, Richard Linklater's Waking Life. In the movie, Jones delivers an epic tirade on human liberty and flourishing. To me, this is what Alex was originally all about before going a little off the deep end. Populist anti-elitism and taking back control from an oppressive corporatocracy trying to distract us with consumerism and endless foreign wars. It's ironic to me that he's now considered a cut and dry right wing kook conspiracy theorist. In fact, in the early 2000s, he was very anti-George W. Bush, anti-the war in Iraq, and against neoconservatism. Well, what do we just say? We bow to the censorship and we promise not to talk about anything serious. In this very raw interview, we discuss his long relationship with Joe Rogan, the mainstream media and its woes, weird science, parapsychology, UFOs, esoteric philosophy, and his role as a societal scapegoat. We even show a clip of Jones making a bone-chillingly accurate prediction in July of 2001 that you'll have to watch to the end of the video to see. My amazing friend Riva Tez joined us in LA and to keep things light, we all decided to drink tequila, play fun trivia games, and do a little arts and crafts. The result is a very unguarded Alex Jones that you're not used to seeing. And if you want more of that Alex, please watch this incredible documentary on him coming out on July 1st by the great director Alex Lee Moyer. I'm linking the movie's website in the description. Without further ado, sit back, relax, and hit subscribe, and join me in welcoming the internet's bogeyman, the conspiracy Conspiracy King himself and this week's scapegoat, Alex Jones. The most hated man in America. No, you're putting words in my mouth. A criminal like Stalin or Trump. Tie me off, snip me. <laughs> you are fake news. I don't see it as left or right. It's bullshit. You know, it gathers speed and ultimately one victim must be killed. I got attacked by all my followers. On the beach! Ah! Shit, man. This is like a cool place where like hobbits live here. Hi, Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, brother. Good to see you. How are you doing? Good, man. Good. I think it's important to situate you for a lot of people because I think a lot of people have a really broad misconception of you. It's really kind of magic out here. I love all this. This looks like where, like I said, Bilbo Baggins would come walking out of here. Or something. Yeah. Gandalf's about to pop out over here. They don't think that you're broadly anti-elitist. You just see that there's this strata of, of humanity that seems to be able to control the rest of uh, the population. Absolutely, I don't see it as left or right. I am just addressing the historical problem of a, entrenched elites that become decadent and corrupt, then start preying on the general population and inevitably launch wars of conquest. I'm really worried about the Russian thing. That could really turn into a big giant war. I think so too. Yeah, it's really bad, so. Jones doesn't just discuss the corrupt elite, he snuck into the notorious Northern California secret society, the Bohemian Grove, in 2000. Members of the society include a lot of America's business elite and top policy decision makers. Inside the Grove, Jones witnessed a bizarre pagan scapegoating midsummer ritual that to this day, I have no idea how to make sense of. When you snuck into the Bohemian Grove, you, you looked at this uh, crazy ritual called the cremation of mm -hmm. care. The whole place and the whole vibe was not Christian or not pious. It got dark, the guys go out there by the little pond, the little lake, yeah. and they do this composite pagan ritual. And I'm standing there with about a thousand men watching it across the pond. The men had really crazy looks on their faces. I would, I would call it satanic. I mean, they were just like, <sighs> <laughs> 
I didn't really believe that they were taking it serious until I was in the crowd with the men, and they were taking this extremely seriously. So you think they're going back to the pagan cult ritual, and it's not, like, like the, it's framed, at least online, as a story where they are celebrating the displacement of the pagan ritual by Christianity, but you would say that they were sort of happily indulging in this kind of age-old pagan ritual. Yes, because it was a, it was a fusion of Moloch worship, uh, you know, the bull out of the Middle East, yeah. Tyre and places, and then it was a fusion of Faustian uh -huh. occultism and Druidic occultism yeah. in a good society, and we know this historically, that builds better civilization and it's more empathetic and loving, adult sacrifice for children, not the other way around. Yeah. And in six societies uh, that was obviously, I think, being influenced by these dark forces and these entities, there, there was the practice of attacking our future yeah. and attacking our civilization and attacking our children. Your father was friends with people in the John Birch Society. Uh, your mom was interested in psychedelic research going on, kind of Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco circles. You had an uncle who was doing sort of clandestine mm -hmm. stuff in South America. So that, did that make you aware of this sort of strata of society that might be pulling the strings more than you thought previously? Absolutely. I mean, there was that background in my family, but it wasn't a, a huge background. But I just got pieces of that there, and I was always really interested in history. I was probably like six, seven years old and asked for these. Yeah. And then my parents oh, ordered cool. them. cool. I would start reading the more simple history stuff. Yeah. Because you can see how a kid would like this. Yeah. It has a lot of writing, also a lot of pictures. Yeah. Uh, and then I started reading scholarly uh, uh, books on, on ancient Rome and mm -hmm. World War One, World War II, just stuff like that. Do you think anybody's ever planted information with you so that people end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater where you're directionally correct on stuff and then you also say stuff that is provably bullshit because people plant it yes, with I you? Yes, I don't think I know I've been set up. and I've learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, but I never really put out this, this info myself up front. Yeah. It was always like, look, the New York Times and Washington Post are all reporting on how 4chan says there's slaves in a pizza place in D.C. So then we go, is it true? And just look at the anomalies. Yep. And the media goes, Jones made this up. And Jones, and I'm like, whoa, 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 you're the ones who put it out. I go, oh, I see what you did. Yeah. And then when I saw QAnon come along, I, I was like, I, I oh, said, I've been set up repeatedly, you know, yeah. by this stuff. And I said, I'm not being set up this time. This is BS. And a lot of my listeners got mad at me because they were buying into, no, Trump's invincible. He's secretly telling me what to do. And I'm like, no, Trump isn't invincible. And it's not, and QAnon's not real. Other than it's a disinfo group doing this. If you switch genders for the day, what would you do? <laughs> I'd be probably a pretty scary looking woman. Uh, well, I have one experience of what it's like. I guess I'd go out and be bad. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'd probably be an ugly woman that nobody wants. A lot of society, if, if they get sort of dissident around a particular idea, it almost feels like the deep state is good at harvesting specific people and then almost having them be scapegoated. There's this philosopher I like named Rene Girard. He has this theory that like there are scapegoats that can sometimes be constructed as like pressure valve releases. Oh, there's no time. doubt that I was used as the archetype of, let's just ban Alex Jones. Yeah. And then they demonize me and all this to kind of demonize the populist archetype to steal my identity and make this new Alex Jones. Yeah. They could use to beat people over the head yeah. and take free speech, but instead that blew up and actually brought us more people. And the, the real scary thing about you, because my first exposure to you was watching Richard Linklater's Waking Life. We're gonna get fired up about the real things, the things that matter, creativity, and the dynamic human spirit that refuses to submit. And it's like the best speech ever. It's like all about like human empowerment. That was one take too. That's amazing. He, he goes, he goes yeah. well, that's it, I'm gonna be here all day. One take, right. thanks. And uh, that's at your core, what you're about. And you got moved into this role of like tinfoil hat wearing crazy conspiracy theorist. That's what my buddy Anthony said last night. He yeah. said, you were a philosopher yeah. that got forced into politics. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fucked up that uh, you just get co-opted. It's scary. You have, well, you're well, that's walking it because, through a, because, because a they take you and build this new thing you're really not. Yeah. And then it makes you bigger, but th th then a lot of people go, well, I'll be that villain then. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, no, no, how do I get away yeah, from this Yeah, you guy? lean in. You lean, yeah. yeah. 
Like yeah, they Sandberg. give you like who? Cheryl Sandberg. Like Cher Celine and like Cheryl Sandberg. <laughs> yeah, but they get they give you a positive feedback loop for the dangerous stuff. And I want to say this right here. You think you're a tough guy? Have me back with a boxing ring in here, and I'll wear red, white, and blue, and you can wear your Jolly Roger. And I do want one of these lemons. I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring one. I'll, I'll get you one right now. Okay, time. There we go. That's a small lemon. As big as my brain. Great. <laughs> And I, I didn't bring my bodyguard because I was scared of you guys. He's just bored at the place. Uh, oh, you should be scared of me. He's probably well, only pulling a dagger. What do you say to people who say you speak too fast and loosely and, and uh, you don't fact check enough? Like even, even when, you, I know you've been friends with Rogan for like 20, 30 years. When you go on his show and he's like, Alex, you need to have a fact checker next to you. What do you what's your response to that? I mean, Joe and I, the times been on a show, don't talk about what we're going to talk about. Yeah. But he's always got a plan, and the truth is, Joe knows all this stuff as much as I do. Right. And and I mean, it's not a secret. We talk a lot. Yeah. Um. And and he knows probably more than I do. Mm -hmm. Um. He was just smarter about the way he did everything, to not get banned and all that. So we didn't pre-script anything. Yeah. He just knew basically everything I was saying could be pulled up. So once I got there, he told Jamie we're going to fact check everything he did. They they, they told me after. He's like, hey, watch it, buddy. We're going to check what you're doing now. And then meanwhile, we've already been talking about all this stuff for months before. Is it annoying to you that like even good friends, like anybody that shows up in public with you has to like figure out a way to artificially have some sort of plausible deniability? Or, 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 That's why we're going to paint stones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was fine with it because he's smarter at, like what we were talking about before the show, what if you put some subliminal codes or, or things in the show and then told people, well, then everybody would actually be watching more intensely and mm -hmm. listening better because they're trying to find the hidden messages. And, and that's a smart thing Joe does is he'll have a guest on and go, really? I didn't know this. And of course, he knows that. Right. And he's not pre-talking to that person. So he's playing 4D chess. It, let yeah. me tell you, everybody said Trump plays 4D chess, which he doesn't. Yeah. And I'm not against Trump. He's really smart and nice in ways and, you know, bad in others like I am and everybody else. But with Joe Rogan, it, it's the real deal. I mean, like, wow. he's the smartest person I know. I've known him 23, 24 years. I've known him well. We've traveled around, partied forever. And, uh, you know, and, and Joe's always real nice and real friendly. Yeah. But, and, but he's got all his long-term plans, and he's thinking 20 steps ahead. He's a wizard. He definitely knows what he's doing. What do you think about people trying to take him out right now? Obviously, all the you know Neil Young, Joni Mitchell stuff, I mean, and then and then after that, this this compilation of, of him saying the N word. Well, I, I mean, I wish he still told all those jokes because they were all against racist. Right. And of course, they snip him out. I mean, he was making fun. Yeah, ninety five percent of them are him. He's quoting a racist, and he's he's saying that they're like fuck them. It's totally dishonest. It's a bunch of crap. It's almost racist and condescending to think anybody would fall for that bullshit. Yeah, if yeah. to think that somebody would fall for the out of context gotcha BS is racist. Joe Rogan is one of the nicest, coolest, humble motherfuckers I've had the pleasure of working with. Fuck the noise, man. You know what they're trying to do. You can't control the man, and he's got the biggest platform in the world right now. And the people trying to use that? Yeah. It, it's all because they want to silence him because he was for medical freedom. Uh, and it's a cheap trick, and then it lessens, it lessens when real racists and real groups do things that are bad. Yeah. All of this racism crap is really hurting everybody. It is, and if, if one of those NPC automatons that cut together that video just thought for like five minutes, critical thinking. Like, is, is he really racist? Does he really, th you know, uh, uh, think bad things about, about black people or any other race? They'd be like, no, he doesn't. He's a really good dude who, who loves everybody. Exactly. It's just bullshit. And to answer your question, I should have answered up front, but I was like already thinking about what you were saying and I went to another point. Um, let's just say this. It was so horrible when they attack him. It was so horrible for the subscriptions over at, uh, at, at Spotify. It's a terrible briar patch to be thrown into. <laughs> yes, you guys are really getting him. And Dave Chappelle waiting in in the cancel culture. Oh, Dave Chappelle never sold out bigger arenas. I mean, we've reached the point where cancel culture, if you can survive it, makes you bigger on the other side. It makes you anti-fragile. If and you don't it, apologize, it, if you apologize, you're fine. But Rogan apologized. My sincere and humble apologies. I wish there was more that I could say, but all of this is just me talking from the bottom of my heart. It makes me sick watching that video. I mean, I feel the strength is to not apologize. If you apologize, it's, uh, it's an admission of guilt. Well, when, yeah, but see, if you listen to how Joe apologized, and I totally agree with you. I, I told him not apologize, and he still did it. He said, listen, 
I don't give a shit. We're sitting there, you know, talking, having dinner. Just like a month ago, he goes, like Dave Chappelle's text messaging him and shit and saying, hey, great job, whatever. Actually, that didn't happen. Anyways, the point is, we're sitting there talking, and I said, don't apologize. And he said, you know, no, no, I'm going to apologize. I don't give a shit about the corporations trying to silence me and, and all these censors. He goes, when the media puts that out, it will hurt some people's feelings really believing I don't like them because they're black people or I use that term and, and, and you know, didn't care about their feelings. I, if I hurt somebody's feelings and, and if they took that wrong, I apologize. He says, I'm going to apologize to those people yeah. that see the compilation, the way it's edited, looks horrible. And, and now I've been used for something hurtful. And he never really gave his full description anywhere. Yeah. A couple of days later, he did a comedy set and said some of it. And Variety picked it up, got yeah. a pretty good quotes. And those quotes he told me at dinner were basically some of the same quotes. But he elaborated and said, I'm doing it for people that actually were hurt by it. Yeah. And, but, I, but I agree. If you just try to apologize to the system so they leave you alone, that gives them more power. But so that's like Joe's nuanced way of doing it. Well, think about Bill Hicks. Like Bill Hicks just got up on stage and was like, if you work in advertising, kill yourself. If anyone here is in advertising or marketing, kill yourself. Yeah. Can you imagine him apologizing? He wouldn't. That was the old days of humor. Humor used to be sardonic, you know? Like it was a cultural commentary. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Hicks stood up on stage and was like, if you work in advertising, kill yourself. I'm not even kidding. There's no joke here whatsoever. <laughs> Suck a tailpipe, fucking hang yourself, borrow a gun from a yank friend. I don't care how you do it. Boy, that's a conspiracy theory I'm sick of. What? That I'm Bill Hicks. That you are Bill Hicks. You haven't seen this? No. Uh, oh my God. People think you are people Bill Hicks. People walk me in restaurants and I mean, and say, Bill, Bill, Bill. No way. What? what? It's bizarre. But it's, you don't even but, but you don't look, look alike. alike. Believe me, I, I know I look like Sam Kinison now. Yeah. No, it's it's um, weirdly a compliment. I have though. such yeah, a crush yeah. on Bill Hicks. Does that mean I have a crush on you? Uh, no, no. <laughs> You're a very lovely he's lady. He's so hot. Yeah, he's so cool. I'll leave. No, 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 no. no. I was one year out of high school when Bill Hicks died. Interesting. And then people saw me like in 95, start on Access TV and then suddenly get a radio show. Uh, they do these facial things where they compare, and of course, I, don't, I look like, I, I look 95% like him, but guys with Welsh last names look kind of alike. Yeah, but, so it's just crazy. Well, wow, that, that is a theory I've never heard, that you are Bill Hicks. Put in Al Show's Bill Hicks and you'll see it. <laughs> That's insane. And to, to your point earlier, if you don't give a shit about all the bad press and you realize it's just a bunch of, like, dumb, kind of smug middlewits who aren't actually, they don't, they're not actually engaging substantively with the content, there is this crazy arbitrage opportunity today where if you if you really don't care, like you, Kanye, Trump, Jake Paul, Elon Musk, I'm thinking of people, Dave Portnoy, people who like, they just stop giving a shit. There's something, it's like an uber yeah, yeah. Nietzschean quality. I mean, I think definitely, you can say whatever you want about Elon Musk, but people can say, oh, he was hype early on or something. Well, I mean, the proof's in the final pudding. I mean, he's the only one to get heavy lifters into space bigger than the Russians and everything he's done is turned to gold and he survived a bunch yeah. of stuff. If anybody's the Uber mentioned, it's Elon Musk. And if you're, if you're walking around like everybody else, self-censoring because you feel like social media won't allow you to say anything and you're repressed, you look at somebody like that and you're like, that's a, that's a free person and you, you live vicariously through them. You're super, even the people that hate Trump, there's something that they're like wildly attracted to him. And well, that's why they hate him is they're attracted to the big peacock yeah. and, and the confidence. And let, I mean, let's face it, he did turn the economy around. He did make us the biggest energy producer. He did incredibly good things. I think his mistake was he started responding to the Russia. He was a Russian agent lie and then made everything about that instead of just ignoring it and moving forward. I mean, his biggest failure was not standing up to cancel culture and not trying to stop the censorship. Uh, and so I still like Trump. I still support him in many ways. But, uh, you know, when he was launching his own social networks, they were openly saying, oh, we don't want to work with this group or that group because they won't censor people we want. Right. And, and you don't need to censor dumbass Nazi, you know, incel dudes that everybody's making fun of. Just let them sit there and spout their bullshit. That's how the open free Internet was for like five, six years yeah, ago. Yeah, you beat, you beat shitty ideas with better ideas. Yeah, you know... But yeah. It, it, it shows, and it sh on the part of the censor, it shows insecurity that those ideas might actually be true. You just let them go out, let them die on their own merit. And Who so the here's fuck how, cares? And here's how the real alchemy worked. They couldn't handle real libertarian or real anarchist type ideas or real populist ideas. That was beating 
the globalist corrupt leftist Silicon Valley model. And so they went, oh, we're going to make the internet safe from Nazis and these people. But really, it was about getting rid of their competition, whose ideas were so popular they couldn't compete with them. Yeah. Uh, so no, I mean, the establishment's not competing with a failed, weird nationalist socialist you know, group from the 1930s. Uh, no, no, they're competing with new ideas and new companies. And you see that even when companies aren't political and they start rivaling the establishment, they either get forced to be bought out or they get called racist and, and canceled. And that's why Joe Rogan's so important is that he did the judo yeah. of, you know, behind the scenes, YouTube trying to censor him, trying to co-op him, trying to control him. And then he just goes and does a deal with Spotify where if they're chickens and they don't support him, he's going to start his own thing, mm -hmm. his own mothership. Mm. Heard it here first. Uh, and he, he could do it more than anyone. If I, I always think the, the, the single person social media stuff doesn't really work. Like, I don't know if Truth Social is going to work, but Rogan might be able to do it. He might be the one person. Well, well, well you can, you could probably do it too. Well, no, I mean, no. you are, you are doing no, it. No, but so. I've got, they can still take things what I did out of context and misrepresent them and, yeah. and, and try to shut me down. Joe's the perfect guy. And I mean, I don't think it's a secret though. Nobody's ever really talked about it. Uh, that, uh, if he gets censored at Spotify or wherever, you know, Joe, Joe, even CNN gets to like, well, if they take him off Spotify, he'll just do his own thing. Yeah. And yeah, CNN, when he tapping his phones, because he's already got the infrastructure, everything set up. Cool. It's all ready to go. It won't be just Joe Rogan. Yeah. It, it'll be hundreds of badasses. That'd be awesome. All in one place. And, and it's all forbidden and it's all what you're not supposed to have. Yeah. And it's going to be the wild, wild west of the next level. He's one of the few dudes where like, I, I would hitch myself to that. I, I'd, I'd work under his thing for well, sure. he's good because he That'd would be absolutely awesome. as long as you're not doing something criminal or, or or doing something that hurts people you know the old-fashioned internet back where okay would you join him absolutely are you kidding yeah right hell i mean <laughs> i mean let me just tell you uh, <laughs> I, i'm i'm kind of sad spotify didn't censor joe uh because uh because i'd want to accelerationism see... you want the accelerationism of the censorship so he does his own thing yeah i mean not literally but 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 <laughs> But then he goes into the real radical plan, which which they all know. I mean, believe me, if, if his and iPhones are tapped, they know. Uh, and I've talked about stuff with Joe, and then a week later it's on CNN. Those guys are spying on people, man. That's why it's just good to have these things out in the open. Yeah. They're not going to stop the renaissance. And the globalists trying to control the renaissance and control ideas, the new renaissance, uh, or, or the new medieval period you're talking about. <laughs> that okay before the renaissance. But... Um, were you actually saying you don't like the Renaissance? You're talking about how great the medieval period I was. I like the medieval period. I'm, I'm, I'm not a super pro in life. I'm, I'm going to get a book that what well, you guys keep talking. That's relevant to this. This is a book called by Umberto Eco, who's this medieval historian, this Italian polymath who died yeah. recently, and uh, it's called Travels in Hyper Reality. And it looks like there's some UFO-like thing on the on the cover. And he writes a lot about ancient medieval secret societies, and he talks about how. Uh, medieval times are very similar to the current times. So modernity is very similar to medieval times. When was the last time you cried? Wow. Um, a couple days ago. Uh, I was digging through a bunch of old photos and was going through a bunch of pictures of my grandparents and my grandmother died a few years ago and I got a little tear in my eye. Have you ever posted something on social media that you regret? Yeah. Even though I, <laughs> yeah, and I'm now joke. banned from social media. <laughs> I would post jokes on social media and then they would say they were serious. So we were like at a little r r Russian restaurant as a joke, me and some of the crew, where we then like banged our, banged our fists and like I look, we, we looked up some Russian words and said like, you know, hail Putin as a joke four years ago. They, they don't put that on TV and go, look, here he is. You know, fur hats and everything, making a joke. So I, I've learned that the left, at least some of their viewers, actually are dumber than I thought they were and they don't get satire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. That's why they didn't get Trump because he yeah, was like yeah. a postmodern performance artist oh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And people like, who I used to like growing up, I used to like Jon Stewart growing up, I interned for Jon Stewart growing up. I, and and Colbert and all these people who I thought were pretty funny yeah, and true. good. And I remember when Colbert did the White House press correspondence dinner. He's like making fun of Bush, and I was like, "This is awesome." He believes the same thing Wednesday that he believed on Monday, no matter what happened Tuesday. And then all of a sudden Trump comes up, and they just didn't get Trump because he was he. Uh, yeah, of course he's sort of 
a joke of a person in, in some ways. He's too free. But he's he's super free, exactly, and it triggered them, and then they became entrenched. Because they, they're all controlled. They're giving talking points. Yeah. They don't deviate. Here's Trump doing whatever the hell he wants. Yeah. The whole bureaucracy said no. I'll tell you who's gotten better is Bill Maher. Yeah, Bill he's Maher's better, like, yeah. hey, yeah. we're not against transgender rights, but DeSantis is right. We don't need the school talking to seven-year-old boys and telling me he might be a girl. I'm not transphobic if I merely disagree with you. Who would have thought that you and Glenn Greenwald and, and Oliver Stone and Tucker Carlson all sound more similar than I would have ever guessed. Like, it feels like the neocon neoliberal center is the thing that's kind of imploding and, and losing everybody's trust and was the reigning regime for so long. And now you have the, the ends, the anti-establishment ends on both sides, the right and the left, sounding a, a lot more similar. There's a loss of legitimacy in the power structure. Mm -hmm. And instead of the power structure reforming itself, it's getting more authoritarian. Mm -hmm. In a thought paradigm, there is a left and right. But I think now with this complex world and all these issues, there's no left or right anymore. Uh, there's only, are you pro-human or are you anti-human? Are yeah. you for transparency and freedom and justice? Or are you for tyranny? The left-right thing is, it's anachronistic. It's like a stupid, like, boomer frame from the 19, 1968 or something. I'm actually very excited by Gen Z. Mario, our videographer, he's Gen Z, and he was really pumped to meet you. I'm pumped yeah. to meet him when he came to Austin. <laughs> we did some shooting together, too. One of the reasons why I'm excited by Gen Z as well is that like they grew up on the internet, they didn't follow like the news so much, and like crypto is so exciting for me because it just bypasses like a much of the traditional hierarchy. No, you're right. The old corporate news to them is like some alien transmission. It's like yeah. what is that? It's like a thing. Mm -hmm. They don't even like they're not even they're not even being engaged by it. But mm -hmm. the boomers watch CNN. They think that's like God. They do. Yeah. It's crazy. It's so annoying when I, I speak to my parents about it. They're like, this the article says that. I'm like, they, but they're so wrong every step of the way. There's no critical thinking. Yeah, like it's even really one of my lawyers is a really good guy, but his wife watches CNN. She's like, how do you represent that devil? Right. And like, he's like, honey, I represent none of that's true. I, 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 Wolf Blitzer said it. And it's like, you know, like, you know how much Wolf Blitzer tells you the truth and so does Google? <laughs> if the news is fake, imagine history. That's a good meme. Yeah. If the news is fake, imagine history. I love that. Yeah. Let's call that tattoo to the little angels. Oh, it's actually Cupid and Psyche. It's William Bergerow's painting. Mm -hmm. Who is the sexiest person in this room? Uh, I would say you are. Okay, great. I just wanted that on film. It's not a hard <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you, were, if you were stranded compliment. on a desert island, who would you want to be stranded with? Uh, my wife, not her. <laughs> <laughs> How do we make men men again? Ooh. Well, tell me what's happened to the real man. You don't own me. You talking to me? The old-fashioned Hollywood cowboy real man. I'm a slob compared to, say, my grandfather's and how hard they worked. And so uh, it's, it's not just that men aren't masculine and women aren't feminine on average anymore. It's There is a uh, basic decadence that's come with all yeah. of our prosperity. So it really just goes back to that cycle of death and rebirth yeah. that, that, that civilizations go through. We've all seen the meme about hard times make strong men and uh, strong men uh, make good times and good times make weak men and then weak men create bad times. Here's an argument that I have. I think the biggest thing you could do for American self-efficacy is actually reduce the ease of liability laws. Because everywhere you go in America, you're reminded of the risks. If you made it less easy for people to sue, it would reduce people hearing about risks all the time, which make them more like have higher self-efficacy. If you're in a defense state, if you think everything's bad, you're not gonna like go out and do, you're not gonna be a great man, you know? Oh, exactly. The insurance companies and the lawyers are ruining the world. Yeah. The answer to make humans more powerful is to bring more controlled risk in to train people to navigate and deal with risk. Like one of the best things left is driving cars 80 miles an hour and the danger and the reality and red lights and people. And, and that's like a super exciting thing going on. They wanna make it driverless where you just sit there and go, mm, and, and it's like, yeah. you know, yeah. look, look, calculators are great, but before I even used them, I was good at math. And, I, and before iPhones came out, I could know 50 people's numbers, 100. Now I know my own number. So Can there's I have no- number? I don't, I think I do barely, but the point is, <laughs> the point is, is that- You shot, you shot. We gotta find how we don't let the technology enslave us. Yeah. And I think that's the whole future, is how do you use technology to empower yourself and others and not have it enslaved? Well, it feels like we need to differentiate between, like software is like eating our brains. And we need to differentiate between tech where humans are in the cockpit and, and controlling it and it's human enhanced. If you think about a spear or a plane, 
it, it, it's human enhancement. It's an extension, it, of, it's an extension of us. Yeah, but my, my favorite Marshall McLuhan quote is every media extension of man is an amputation. And if you think about social media and you think about most IT, most software, it's literally like severing your, li you're outsourcing your sense of direction with Google Maps. You're outsourcing, you know, your, uh, your recall. That's it, like I with used Google. to, when I was even a teenager, I would get a map out and I would look at it and figure it out. And then I wouldn't even take the map. I would just say, turn here, turn there, write it down. And I could be going a thousand miles or 20. And then I would just go. Mm -hmm. And then also you tell girls, hey, we'll meet at the movie theater. We'll meet here. Yeah. We'll meet at the lake. And then it was like, you never know who's going to be there. And then they're there. It's serendipity. And, and instead you're like texting them the whole time. You're going to be there. And it's like horrible. Well, we, well, reality is like way cooler AI than whatever shitty compressed, you know, software AI we're looking at. And there's, there's synchronicities and serendipity. And I, who knows why the UFO stuff is real. I, I tend to think it is. If that's true, re reality is way weirder than we think it is. And we should explore this. We, get, we don't understand human biology. We should uh, explore Certainly that. Certainly the rollout of not technology. Not going to the metaverse. Exactly. It's been to be, pre pre oh God, the metaverse is the most predatory thing. In the no, no, flip it, flip it. The metaverse is the best thing in that's the right. world. I and love Mark Zuckerberg. I want to, <laughs> I agree with him when he said two weeks ago, we'll all soon be living in the metaverse and not... I like that. That sounds like a wonderful place that he runs. It doesn't sound like hell at all. That reminds me of a clip in Alex's War, this amazing documentary about you, where it's before you're walking into the Bohemian Grove and you and your producer at the time are like practicing, trying yeah, yeah. to sound like Bohemian Grove. Yeah, nanotechnology. Men. It's my favorite quote of yours ever. You're like pretending to be an elitist globalist and you're just like, you're like oh, like nanotechnology, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you were so ahead of the time, but that's literally everyone right now. But you said that. Yeah, you were ago. basically saying that Moore's law yeah. is like an S curve and it's slowing down. You're like the the amount of transistors <laughs> yeah. on a semiconductor is slowing down. But it, and what are we going to do when we reach that limit? So what's going to happen with brain computer interfaces? Yeah, oh, well, everything. But you think Elon Musk is an Ubermensch, but he believes in that stuff. Yeah, why? Yeah, it's not, well, it's not he, good. When I say yeah. Ubermensch, I don't mean like like he's God or whatever. I'm just saying, I mean, if you get to look at somebody who's like the archetype of innovating and taking stuff over and doing it all not the stagnant elite, that would be it. So of course he wants to dominate this, and dominate that, and dominate everything. Cause that's like a full spectrum yeah. dominance. But if you, if you, the whole, if you can't beat him, join him, AI narrative. Well, that's, that's it. I that's mean, bad. That's not good. No, I totally, agree, I totally agree with you that I'm saying if, if adults want to go put wires in their heads and chips, they should do it. But it shouldn't be pushed on children. It shouldn't be out there. All I know is if you want to take somebody that's like a Henry Ford type innovator. Yeah, it's amazing. You'd have to say, you know, it's him. It's awesome. He's, I'm grateful he exists. I yeah, think he's yeah. an incredible person. And he's getting better and better. Like, you shouldn't be made to take shots. A year and a half ago when it was first starting, not now. And, you know, just a lot of stuff that, like, he was the biggest guy standing up. So he went from kind of in my calculus to 60% good, 40% bad, about 80% good, 20% bad. So I really am a big fan of the direction he's going. feels like he saw Trump, because he made a shift, I think, in 2016. And I feel like he saw what Trump was doing. And it was this weird thing where he took up a lot of those tactics. And now you could say, I mean, he's the best industrialist in the world, but he's also the best marketer. Like his memes Everything. and his ability to use he's Twitter. He's got it all. The second to none. He's got it all. Yeah, it's, it's freaky. What is your worst habit? Eating too much food and being a lazy ass. That's fair. Yeah. If you could only hear one song for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh man. I mean, I love everything from like Karina Burana to uh, Stairway to Heaven to, to Along the Watchtower mm. uh, to Steppenwolf. Um, I would have to say the compendium of all the songs together. I'll be the new conductor and I, <laughs> I put them all back to back, trillions of songs, and I can decide what I want to listen to. I had dreams, particularly when I was young, but still have it sometimes where I, I, sometimes it would be the most innocuous thing, sometimes yeah. it would be an intense thing. I mean, I said they're going to blow up the World Trade Center and blame it on bin Laden in July. And there's a famous on-air call you have with Joe Rogan where you're like, I've been talking about this for the last six months. Joe, you know I was predicting this, uh, telling you all about it. Well, you know, you do predict that the government is doing these things, but I mean, uh, you don't believe that there's people in other countries that hate us? And you, you have this thing in your mind that there's a grand scheme and a grand plan. What do you think they're trying to accomplish with Why did Hitler burn the Reichstag? Oh, you know. He's been elected chancellor. He wanted to abolish the presidency and become pure. We know the government's planning terrorism. We know Oklahoma City was terrorism. We know the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted to blow up airliner. If you do it, we're going to blame you because we know who's up to it. Or if you let some terrorist group do it, like the World Trade Center, we know who to blame. That was because I would have only a couple times I had that dream. Yeah. 
but I would wake up sweating and usually throw up. And it's like you've gone to the future. Yeah. And somewhere in your mind, you've like fold space or something. Yeah. And, and, but, but I can't control it. Unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. You've had a history of doom. You had like, you know, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, and all, everybody in the 70s was saying the world was about to end and it was going to end in a, you know, a 30 year time horizon or whatever. And all, that obviously didn't come to roost. And so it feels like every generation has this sort of doomsday or, and it is, it's interesting as a noble lie, you think of environmentalists and they're sort of, in some ways, they're really anti-humanism, like they're yes. anti-human output in this really sort of uh, uh, repressive uh, uh, kind of way. And so as a follow-up to that question, do you believe in sort of mind over matter effects? Do you believe in parapsychology? The, the, the ability for the mind to Well, affect. we know in thousands of repeated tests that there is quantum physics going on and that when you observe something, it has a different effect than when you're not observing it. Yeah. And then so they're wondering why is our observation of something fundamentally changing it? And if that's the case, and yeah, you have exactly the double slit experiment, you get basically a, a, a wave interference pattern if you don't observe it. And then if you observe it, it, it goes through one of the, the slits. So basically you have a wave function which is probabilistic in nature. And then a human observer, if they're present, they collapse that wave function into a specific eigenstate, which somebody like Roger Penrose would say basically means that there's a quantum sensor in the human brain, which I think is really interesting. It turns quantum reality into classical reality, which is what we're viewing. And so the, 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 the actual sub-architecture of reality is something that's probabilistic and, and uh, exactly. much more it's variable mani than Reality is manifesting the way our brain decodes it. And so our brain basically can't you know, let us see the fact that actually this is not the real nature of reality. Yes. And then if your mind has this crazy disproportionate impact on uh, sort of material and uh, you, we don't live in this kind of Cartesian dualist universe where your mind is just physics, like if there's something sort of very special about the human mind, then uh, you have a disproportionate impact on your, you know, the material substrate and belief is a confounding variable in every experiment. And then you project onto that and then the architecture is built according to this basic level programming, but we all have connections that we can open up to larger, more complex systems. Yes. But it's hard to experience uh, for most people. And all, all data that we have is basically, there's the experimenter has an impact on, on the yeah. data that you collect from it's any experiment. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's all somewhat skewed based on some top-down ideology, which if, it is a completely heretical thing to say, because we're supposed to have this kind of objective scientific layer where yeah, science, is science is settled, but in real science, it's never settled. And we're always learning more. And then a lot of times it's not that something previous was disproven. It just turns out that it was just a small part of something bigger. And then we find something bigger and something bigger and something more complex. We know so little about physics. I mean, if something that blows people's minds, like especially normal people's minds, is that all observable reality is like 5% of like the world of like matter. Right? Absolutely. And like 95% is something that we claim to be dark energy and dark matter. Like what the, f what is that? How would you rate your looks on a scale of one to 10? Uh, 25 years ago, a 10. Right now, about a four. I'm about to go on a huge deal. I'm going to lose 100 pounds, or I'm going to. I love How it. are you going to do it? Yeah. What's your plan? I'm just going to work out twice a day and stop eating a bunch of shit and stop drinking. And I, and I can stop drinking. I do that pretty easy. It's, uh, it's important too, man, for the content that you put out. Being in a good place physically is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've, I've definitely I've let the stress get to me, so I'm trying to trick my mind to to do what I can do, but not care as much. I really get upset by the stuff, and then it releases releases a lot of cortisol. <laughs> What is my problem? Yeah. So, so yeah. That's fair. Alex, do you believe in therapy or do you think it's bullshit? I think if it's the right person and you've got real goals, yeah. they can help you. I think most of it's bullshit. Yep. I agree with what they, everything you just said. What's your biggest insecurity? Oh. Oh, God. Uh, just that I'm not that I'm being lazy and, and not really working out my ideas and doing a better job presenting them and that I've got really important work to do. Alex, what's your favorite conspiracy that you think most people are off on that you're highest conviction in? I mean, I think modern science tries to compartmentalize things and, and always say that they've got the, the facts and it's all decided, but real science is always asking questions. Also with the old alchemist, they were trying to figure things out in the natural world, but also adding 
you know, a, a wonder to it or, or the idea of magic, mm. meaning things we haven't broken through to yet, but we know we're there. Things we haven't cataloged yet, but we know we're real. And so you have to go into it with that wonderment and knowing magic could happen because as you're discovering the new keys to another level of the universe, you need to have that sense of openness for it to happen. Yeah. We over-index on the scientific method when we turned natural philosophy into science. Science is an industry before it was natural philosophy. And then we got the scientific method. If it doesn't fit in the scientific method, it's not real. Exactly, yeah. But Francis Bacon, you have to go into every experiment with a priori skepticism, yeah. which literally affects the experiment. Yeah, seriously. And if parapsychology is true, then belief in the positive or negative sense will actually affect the results of the experiment. And so, but yeah, it's a super profound thing that we're missing. Gentlemen, the experiment is a success. We know science is bullshit because imagine like Galileo couldn't be peer reviewed. That's right. Right? Like you can't peer review actual innovation. We need epistemological anarchism. Like science was anarchy until the 20th century. And, and, and it was always uh -huh. a anarchy. It was always alchemy and, and like Copernicus and yeah. all of them getting locked up and stuff because they said the planets were, you know, round and yeah. they were orbiting and the earth was not the center of the universe. Yeah. You look at Francis Bacon and he was super into alchemy and, you know, he wrote a book called New Atlantis and Newton was an alchemist as well. So you have all these early enlightenment thinkers and then you, you get this progressive bifurcation of science and the spirit where all of those guys were polymaths. They were doing all sorts of weird shit as well as science and that wasn't considered heretical. That was sort of part of the plot. And now you have these sort of middle wit scientists who claim that they know the truth. They're super anti pseudoscience or alchemy or all these other, you have Michael Shermer and all these skeptics sort of saying, you know, it's all pseudoscience. Yeah. Um, and then you have sort of really woo woo people who are like, you know, all about manifestation, mind over matter, well, but it's a sad bifurcation because we can't make progress. You, you want those, you want polymaths, you want people who have both. Well, there's studies that show prayer is, for things is a lot better than exactly. drugs. Exactly. And placebo is a dirty word, but it, yeah. it works. Yeah, yeah. People say, oh, no, that was placebo. And then you're admitting that belief affects whatever control group because they believe they like took the pill. Absolutely. But, and when she talked about dark matter, when you brought up the observer effect in those studies, I was thinking, what's the term I want to bring up? What's the point I want to make? Yeah. And it was dark matter. And then she brought it up. And obviously, all the different ancients, particularly the Egyptians and others, said that there was this outside power holding everything together, and, and, and we were only a manifestation of that. Uh, the uh, Mayans thought that, the ancient, you know, every major ancient culture thought that. And then with the equations of Einstein and Max Planck and others, yeah. they said clearly there's something four or five times more powerful holding this all together. And now with all these complex systems and, and, and radio telescopes and spectrometers and supercomputers, all these different devices, they have been you know, proven, as you know, in the last 30 years that, that this dark matter is there many times more powerful than, than the dimension we see holding it all together, forcing it. So is that a simulation or is that all our group collective that is actually manifesting all of this as a giant, a giant art project we're doing or something? I mean, maybe we're like another species having hallucination or something else and, and then it's manifesting all this. May I ask, who are you? Are you the Lord Buddha? Careful. If you could be reincarnated into anyone's body, what would you want to become? Pamela Anderson. Mike Tyson. I love you both. Do we pick the extreme female and extreme masculine. What if you fuse Pamela Anderson as a clone hybrid with Mike Tyson? I mean, for me, it's like they're doing human-animal cloning. Yeah. They've been doing it forever. It was in the medical literature 25 years ago. Yeah. People are like, how did Jones know they're splicing humans with animals? Yeah. Because it's been in mainline medical literature for decades. And all I'm saying is we should have a debate about it. There's an early 20th century evolutionary thinker, Richard Goldschmidt, and he had this idea of hopeful monsters, and he would breed between species so you create something like a liger that's like a lion and a tiger mixed right oh yeah and like 90 percent of these things die but every once in a while you get one yeah. that feeds on some niche of resources that you know uh, uh, others cannot and then they they sort of move on that's how you get these kind of punctuated equilibria stepwise. He, well, he's talking about accelerating evolution yeah there's, there's always the argument they say it's billions of years but really now they know there's these jumps well, I mean, I think about that all the time. Human homo sapiens have been around for 100,000 years. And just in the last 10,000 years, we've gotten, you know, culture and history and agriculture. And it happened to me in this crazy quick point, you know. And so to me, I think there's some more to that story. 
I mean, if you read the books of Francis Galton and then the Huxleys and the Wedgwoods and all them, and yeah. how they had those weird interbreeding programs, yeah. and how they believed they were going to develop the Superman out of it, and they developed the projection of computers and the projection of uh, all the different uh, biometrics and all these sciences 150, 160, 170 years ago that, that, that they just theoretically talked about, mm -hmm. that then the scientists were able to take and build and do, and then that's how in 1931 you could have... Uh, Aldous Huxley, whose brother went on to be the top, you know, transhumanist and all that, the founder of all that. Julian Huxley. Uh, yeah, yeah, Julian Huxley saying in a 61 speech in a Brave New World Revisited, no, we wrote this book in 31. He wrote, you know, some of his brother's help. He gave a speech, I guess, here at Berkeley. He said, we wrote all this in 31 because this is what we were planning and what had been developed over the last 60, 70 years by our families. It's where we thought humanity was going. And it's not going to be a 1984 future. That's going to fall away. It's going to be... A, you know, a chemical system of, 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 of and, and biological control and genetic engineering. And he said, and that's your choice whether you want to be under that or not, but that's where we see things going. And so that's pure, just absolute brainstorming by these few families. Yeah. And then they basically projected what has become the whole modern world. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, it, fe it feels like they did. And they, I mean, uh, you read like Perennial Philosophy by Huxley. He, he was pretty trippy. He actually, he, right before he died, he took a massive amount of LSD mm -hmm. and was very interested in esotericism. And he also was a big fan of William James, James's transmission theory of consciousness, that the brain was actually a receptor for some sort of higher consciousness. It wasn't, didn't produce consciousness. It was an antenna. It was an antenna. There are two kinds of functions. There is the productive function, where we say that mind is actually produced by some kind of material activity. Uh, but there is also what he calls the transmissive function, that uh, matter, and especially the central nervous system, is the organ, the reducing valve, through which a previously existing mind stuff uh, passes into the uh, material world. Well, we know electrochemically the DNA is doing that now, and I totally believe in that, and, and that's why a lot of tribes and groups would like not, not would like activate epigenetics by like you know the you know like the, the the head leaders dying and it, it, you see it in books like Dune and stuff because Frank Herbert didn't invent that he was just picking that up in culture and anthropology and then like you go in and get the chief and the chief like helps transmit the knowledge to you yes and then however you see that it's basically activating it there through the ritual because it was already there or through the sixth sense it's actually giving you a download upon yeah. death I've been around anybody that's been around and, and is dying and if they got time a few days while they're dying they start telling you everything. But also the energy is not just them talking to you. It's like you're picking up a bunch of stuff. And then you have a lot of intense stuff after it happens. Well, the mystery rituals are all simulating death. So every initiation, right, in every culture, you're, sim you're simulating killing the physical body. Yeah. Which means the sensory organs are actually... It's like communion. You're eating and drinking Christ's blood. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and the sensory organs are reductive on a default state of greater omniscience. Which, is like... You, yeah, think about it. You're all in a yeah. church. Yeah eating the body of Christ, drinking the blood of Christ, all having communion becoming one and you're yeah. all broadcasting. Yeah, and, and maybe, you know, those things were literally psychedelics in the past. They probably were. I mean, there's a guy named John Allegro that thought that the Eucharist was actually, you know, the flesh of Christ was actually the Amanita muscaria mushroom. I don't know if that specifically is true, but these things... Well, definitely all those cultures were, were, were pharmacia, were, were taking that stuff. Probably. And, and, and it, with most religious stuff, you'd have the outer group that wasn't taking the hallucinogens exactly. of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the high priest or the, or the witch doctor or the shaman. But then, yeah, that's going on. Yeah, what William James divides religion into prophets who have like direct downloads and then people who experience garden variety religion, which is they are transmitted the noble mythology, but it's in a way to sort of control them. They show up to church, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, they're not getting the direct downloads. And maybe it's weird if everybody does get the direct downloads. Maybe that's the apocalypse, but maybe we're headed in that direction. It's like the boomers. They got too many downloads too quickly and it, it, it wasn't in step with like real personal progress. Like they would take, you know, crazy doses of, of like Timothy Leary, who might have been a deep state construct himself, sort of promoted the taking of these like doses that were way out of whack of all of these things. You get way too many downloads. You don't do the requisite kind of personal work. And then you get the message from the elves, kill yourselves. There's too many people, murder yourselves. That's when you, you get in the dark side, that's what's happening. And just like King Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, but you don't even really know if God liked him, whereas King David was a man after God's own heart, you know, the son goes way further than the father, but then goes into so many dark areas and does so many things. When you stare into the abyss, as Nietzsche said, 
huh. you you basically change. And so I think that's that's where a lot of that comes from. Yeah, but I, I also think that people just don't want people to be like the elites don't want people to be too powerful. If we actually believed in power psychology and the power of belief, it would mean that we were unrulable. You can't rule great people if they have all their skills. Yeah, it's super libertarian. All of a sudden, you can you can see into them, they can see into you, but it's 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 bi-directional. Great men can't be ruled. Oh, absolutely. But that's I mean, you just said it. But because we're all connected, when they try to dumb us down, they're hurting themselves. Mm. And so I think that's really the, the 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 process of the real alchemy that you keep seeing in the Bible is the is the separation of you know the, the good metal from the garbage or the wheat from the chaff, mm. you know, the goats from the sheep. I think that's what's going to happen. It feels like, very broadly and crudely speaking, it's a war between human consciousness and Borg-like uh, metaverse consciousness. And, and those two things are going to come to a front. And you'll end up with certain people kind of in the fetal position in some sort of nutrient soup hooked up to the Borg, you know, getting, getting the you know, state propaganda downloads. And then you'll end up with these other people with very expanded parapsychological minds. And, and you'll see this bifurcation, maybe even speciation of, of mankind. I totally agree. And that's already happening. And it's, it's scary. It's lowering everything. You know, it, it, people on their phones and watching TV all day and being part of the system, it, it's killing them. Yeah. Well, tell us about your first kiss. Uh, oh, my God. I mean, I, I, day one, all the other boys like, girls are gross. I'm like, no, they're not. And I, was kissing, <laughs> I was kissing girls in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I was always like, oh, you're so nice, so pretty. So, I mean, I, I was never, uh, I, very, very young. Early bloomer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I didn't have some sexual desire for my mother, but when I look at her, very beautiful blonde, you know, red lipstick, you know, very beautiful woman, I was like, I was like, mommy, yeah. I was just, that looks really good, I like that. I would never say it if it wasn't true. What, what should we do in terms of the rot, like just free form? I'm gonna paint a blue sky. Yeah. Do you feel Al Alex can do a Freudian homage to his mother. <laughs> yeah, it's that'll, that'll Oedipus complex. Oedipal complex. I'm painting myself. You're painting yourself. Wow, look at that. That's a great, yeah. Actually, my favorite entrepreneur is the guy who made Pet Rocks. Really? It's like Dasani water is just like tap water. I love that shit. That's just like fake. <laughs> Just, just literally repurposing rocks. Yeah, you just like rocks and like put them in a box and say these are pet rocks and they're a toy now. It's a good supply chain right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the supply chain? Are we fucked? Yeah, it's, well, it's a purposeful safe. reset. So that's, that's a real deal. It's corporations want to make everybody poor. Yeah. So they can control them. At least they got a consensus. I mean, they're all doing it. Doesn't mean we won't find ways around it. So you think that we're living in a world, Alex, of kind of manufactured scarcity? That yes in the name, and they're always telling us, you know, in the name that it's artificial so they can selectively jack up prices and stop innovation. And then there's some like layer of elites that are, live with endless resources. Well, we play these little local games, we're on these little treadmills and... Yeah, exactly, but there's some argument that, you know, well, cut the resources so we're not as lazy or whatever. But the point is, is that th that group never is austere themselves. Mm. So you can't have people that have all the money Tell us we gotta be austere, but then they're not. Who would you hate to see naked? <laughs> Why myself? No, uh, <laughs> I would hate to see Bill Gates naked. I knew you were gonna say that somehow. Oh, I knew yeah. That. yeah, yeah, it was good. Who would you like She's to see naked? got an image in my... Uh, I mean, I'm married, so, but I always, you know, I like to see lovely ladies naked. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, it means you're a man. <laughs> yeah. If you could suddenly become invisible, what would you do? Wow. Oh, that's a great I question. That. I should be asking you these questions. In fact, in a minute, I'm going to go through them with you. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can I do love that. it. Because uh, you, need, you need to talk. You're much more interesting. That <laughs> voice would be she's great for voiceovers. I know. It would be. In fact, I'm going to hire you for voiceovers. I will, I will <laughs> intro you whenever you want. I need it. The English, the English voice is very strong. Everyone gives me 10 more IQ points, which I love. No, no, but there's a lot of different types of English or British accents. What would you call Yours sounds high class. Well, I actually, I grew up on a homo shelter, but I got sent to a boarding school that had elocution lessons. So every Friday when there was hymn practice, I sat alone with a, with a teacher and got taught how to speak properly. So I don't speak like anyone in my family. Yeah, because you sound like the Queen of England. Yeah. I mean, you've definitely got, <laughs> I'm and now you're going to discuss the, you know, it's very good. It's very proper. Okay, but you have to ask the question. If you just suddenly me. become invisible, what would you do? If I suddenly became invisible, that's a really good question. I don't know what I would do. You could do. sneak into something, though. Like, you, you snuck into Bohemian Grove. Imagine if you were invisible. I've, I've snuck into Bilderberg groups. Yeah. Uh, Have I, you? Oh, yeah, I've snuck. Yeah, I've been kicked out, you know. Wow. At gunpoint. Move! Move! 
Oh my God. I had my camera stuff taken, you know, twice. Um, or I could just walk through the front door if I was a big tech type of it. But were they doing anything? And by the way, I don't judge everybody that's been to Build a Bear. I get they have people there that are part of other stuff. But Do was what? Build a Bear even doing anything interesting? Just a bunch of guys. Oh, like no, it's the secret. It, it's it's like one of the most elite globalist groups where they're making final deals and battle planning. Then they have the Davos group go out, the, the World Economic Forum, and kind of be their mouthpiece. I mean, if there's a if there's a place where you've got like half of them are James Bond villains, that's it. But, but I mean, then there'll be some a few select journalists, a few people they want to talk to that are tech people. I mean, not everybody that goes to Bohemian Grove is bad. Most of them are good. Uh, not everybody that goes to Bilderberg is bad. But the different steering committee and the Klaus Schwab, you know, he's 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 been like yeah. What's that. his deal, Klaus Schwab? He's been the he's he's really the head gopher at, at the Bilderberg Group that kind of organized it and ran it. And then they decided by the seventies to have a public arm that then went really operational in the nineties. Does he have power? A lot of power, yeah. Does he? Because he seems on on one level, you read about the Great Reset stuff, and you're like, this is feels like what's happening. It's like weird corporatocracy and horizontal integration between like big companies and, and government. And then on another level, you're like, this guy seems like a joke. We are here at the headquarters of the World Economic Forum. Like he wears like these like cartoonishly villainous outfits. Well, I mean, he's a real deal. What is your greatest fear in a relationship? Mm. And one for you, Jesse, too. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's the, you really love somebody, you invest in them, and, and then they leave you. I mean, and then you have that hurt. That's the biggest it's uh, the problem. How do you get over yeah. that? I mean, I think when you get older, it just gets easier because you realize you're going to lose everything anyways in this life. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's, but it's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all, as they say. It's good for me to hear that right now, so it's good. good What's your me. biggest insecurity? Uh, I have intimacy issues like Jesse does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my head. I'm a brain in a vat trying to experience my body. Same, same, yeah. yeah. Would you prefer a wild, hot relationship or a calm and stable one? Wild and hot. Come on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> these are funny. Look at these guys over here. Look at them in here. Okay. Like the Legion of Doom over there. <laughs> right, I'm asking you, who's the sexiest person in this room? Reba. Yeah, that's an easy question. <laughs> okay. You have to say this about yourself now. Reba, who is the sexiest person in the room? Me. That, there you go. Good, <laughs> good answer. When was the last time you got really angry? <sighs> really angry. You were angry at me today because I was late. I don't think I was that angry. You told me you were a 5 out of 10 when I, when I arrived. That I was what? <laughs> I asked Alex how mad you were, and he said a 5 out of 10. <laughs> it's bullshit, Alex. <laughs> I was, I know, I was, I was happy. Hey, I, was I fell run. asleep for a minute. I'm sorry I was late. Don't be mad. No, it. you're good. We're so mad. When was the last time you were super angry? Uh, when was the last time I was I do get, angry? like, anal about the show. I get type A about, like, you know, I want everything You have frantic be. energy. Yeah. Right. If you could only use one swear word for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? That'd be fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Just fuck sounds good. Yeah. It's a great sounding word. Well, it was banned by the uh, Norman because the Anglo-Saxons used it. Is that true? There's a whole list of words they couldn't use. Man, you know a lot of shit. Well, it's fun to use the word. Why, why can't I use the word fuck? And, and like in the Norman, you know, they're like calling it, you know, Congress or something. It's like, it's fuck. It sounds yeah, good. Yeah, it's like, the most powerful. And it, it feels with the way it means. It's well, semantically, it's an odd. And those people, exactly. I mean, it wasn't a bad word. It's like, it fucking's good. Yeah. Like, you know. And you know, this goes back to the Norman Conquest. This is, is an Anglo Saxon deal because they would cut the fingers off so that they couldn't have the longbowmen. After they'd capture you, they'd cut your fingers off if they let you go, uh. even though they win the battle. So so they would do this. So that that's where when Winston Churchill. Doesn't just mean victory. That means that means I got my fucking fingers. I'm gonna kill you. Wow. That's where that comes from. I didn't know. That's where it comes from. Do you think Nixon knew that? Because he that was his. Yeah, probably. You know, well, it is a fuck you. But it's I like mean, a yeah, hidden yeah. in plain sight yeah. message. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Damn. Yeah, it means I still fucking got my. I still got. I'm gonna kill your ass. Like you didn't take my weapons. Wow. That's what this means right here. Wow, still here. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah, yeah, still got my. Wow. That's like when Churchill's going to Hitler. Like, uh -huh. hey, buddy, you got your fucking. Uh -huh. You got victory. If you were reborn, which country would you want to be born in? <laughs> I almost want to say something like Dagestan, like um, Khabib. You know, just be like a tough motherfucker, like fighting bears at the age of seven or eight. If you could hear only one song the rest of your life, what would it be? Babe, I'm going to leave you, Led Zeppelin. One More Chance by Billie Holiday. Oh, yeah. This is me. Wow. 
Exactly. Very nice. <laughs> I didn't know you were a jack o' lantern. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you get? Sounds like a sunset. I knew where you're Oh, that's beautiful. That's like a almost looks like Chicago Cubs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like that. And what then the fuck is you? I just did a little three part a triptych, if you will. You know. It's like a pecan. It's a <laughs> it's a pecan. Well done, Jesse. You're very talented. <laughs> Thank you. I've done well all day. Yeah, Hopefully right. we haven't angered the YouTube gods. <laughs> yeah, we bow down to the Central Committee. We of love the, Google. <laughs> of the, of the, we of love the, Google. Thank you, Andreessen Horowitz, for sponsoring this show. D C C C. Yes. <laughs> Up with the Democratic Party. Huh.